Look, thanks everybody for joining this morning. My name is Alan Thorber. I'm the Chief Executive of Mindroom. And we are really pleased to be partnering with Burness Paul today uh, on such an important topic that I'm sure is on your agenda um, from a workplace point of view. And the purpose of today really is to look at neuro inclusion at work and um, specifically from a legal perspective. So what I would like to do today is just set out a little bit about the outline of the session, um, some housekeeping, and then introduce our speakers. And uh, there will be time for Q&A, so there'll be a chat function you can use for that. Um, and we'll get you away on time as promised. And um, hopefully you will go away from the meeting having learned a few things and uh, made some connections as well, perhaps. So um, Enya, if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. Uh, so the purpose of today is to, first of all, just recap what neurodiversity is and isn't. Um, understanding the benefits of supporting neurodivergent staff within the workplace. Um, insights into your legal obligations, which Morag will more than ably cover. And then some well-known approaches to support neuro inclusion at a workplace level. So this will be drawn from a lot of the good practice, not only within Burness Paul, um, but beyond that as well. And then, as I say, an opportunity for you to ask questions of us as we um, as we get to the end of the session too. Um, so, any if we could cover housekeeping, please. Uh, so, as ever, if you wouldn't mind just muting. Uh, to limit background noise. As I say, there is a chat function on Zoom, so I'm sure by now we all know where to find these things. Um, we are recording, as you'll see, and the transcript and recording will go onto Burness Paul's YouTube channel, but you can also request to follow the transcript as we go along as well. And we'll do our best to cover all the questions that we can, um, but I will just point out, we're not giving specific legal advice today, um, more so just drawing on the uh, framework. So um, I'm happy to say we are running some further deep dive sessions with Burness Paul after the summer, and we'll have dates for your diary um, shortly. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce Morag Moffat, who's an employment law partner at Burness Paul, and Morag will introduce ourselves more fully in a moment, and Nellie Whaley, who is our training manager here at Mindroom 2. <laughs> So without further ado, I'm going to hand to you, Nelly, to set out what new diversity is and isn't, and we will get started. Thank you very much, Alan, and a big warm welcome to everybody who has joined us today. As Alan had mentioned, um, my name is Nelly Whaley. I am the training manager at Southson Mindroom Centre. So my role involves delivering the neurodiversity at work training, as well as delivering other neurodiversity training more widely within the community. Um, my background is in within uh, inclusive education. Uh, I've supported neurodivergent children and young people. But more recently, my professional focus has been in the field of inclusion, um, family support, parent and carer support, training professionals, and finally, what we're doing today within employment. So I wanted to start today's session um, to start with what is neurodiversity? So you'll see on the slide coming up, this is a definition uh, which is provided by Dr. Nick Walker. Um, and you know, if you're happy just to, thank you. Um, and Nick Walker, he is, they are a neurodivergent writer and professor of psychology. Um, and you can just see here on the right, um, this is an image attached of a scan of a brain activity, which I hope should help illustrate the beauty and the complexity of all um, the brain and the wiring, the different colors here. Um, this is what has said to um, create different neurotypes. To touch on a few um, kind of key points around neurodiversity, um, we are talking and using this terminology today um, in the process of thinking about neurodiversity that we're all different in how we think, how we learn, because all brains process information differently. So just as our fingertips um, are unique, so are our minds. Neurodiversity promotes inclusivity, 
it actively works against stigma, fostering environments where all types of minds are valued and respected. Neurodiversity reflects the variations in people's experiences, which may lead to distinct differences, significantly enough to correspond with diagnostic labels such as autism, ADHD, dyslexia. And neurodiversity recognizes that many people may face real life challenges, but it really focuses on strengths, celebrating unique perspectives of neurodivergent individuals. So embracing neurodiversity offers an opportunity for a more inclusive society that values and celebrates the diverse contributions of all individuals, regardless of their neurological makeup. Now, just in terms of statistics, um, the current statistics at the moment um, state that around 15 to 20 percent of the population are considered to be neurodivergent. So that's just a little bit of an introduction today. Now, I wanted us to talk about why neurodiversity matters in the workplace. So you'll see on the next screen um, some statistics, which I'll go through. So I wanted to explore why neurodiversity matters in the workplace. As I've mentioned, between 15 and 20% of the UK population are neurodivergent. So that's a significant portion of our community whose unique perspectives and talents we cannot afford to overlook. However, the reality is that many neurodivergent employees have faced negative reactions and stigma. For example, you'll see on my screen, 30 to 50% of individuals are in the prison system, reflecting broader systematic failures in understanding and accommodating neurodiversity. Now, in the workplace, the situation for some neurodivergent individuals um, are, st are still quite challenging. As you can see, 65% of managers and decision makers lack the understanding of neurodiversity. So this gap in awareness often leads to some exclusionary practices and a lack of necessary support for neurodivergent employees. So it's no surprise then that 49% of neurodivergent individuals have left a job due to workplace discrimination. So imagine the loss of that potential talent in the workplace and then the personal toll that can take on an individual. Mental health is another critical aspect. Um, over 70% of neurodivergent employees have reported facing challenges with their mental health. And this is often exacerbated by an unsupportive work environment. As we can see, additionally, 65% of employees worry about stigma and discrimination from management, while 40% believe their colleagues behave in ways that exclude them. And these issues often start early, where 85% of neurodivergent adults reported they recalled being left out of activities as children. So as we reflect on these statistics, it is clear that fostering an inclusive workplace for neurodivergent individuals is crucial. So by educating ourselves and our colleagues, we can implement supportive policies and actively challenge stigma. So our work environments are valuing everyone and everybody can thrive. And just to point out that valuing new neurodiversity is not just about being inclusive, it is about harnessing a diverse range of skills, perspectives and talents that can drive innovation and success. And that is something we're going to explore um, further on in our webinar. So I'm going to pass over to Morag, who will now offer a little bit more around the legal perspective. I think you might be muted, Morag. You'd think I'd learned by now. Apologies. So good morning, everyone. It's great to have you with us this morning. I'm a partner in the employment team at uh, Burnus Poll, um, and we act for employers across the UK. And I've seen a real trend um, in uh, requests for advice from our clients in relation to neuroinclusion, 
in the workplace and supporting those with neurodivergencies. Um, I lead our Be Valued employee uh, network internally, and it's of great importance to us um, at, at Burness Paul that we ourselves foster our own culture for our staff to feel able to be them best selves at work and, uh, and to support them. So um, it, I, I have an interest in it. Um, uh, both professionally um, in those regards, as well as personally as the mother of uh, two children with neurodivergencies. So I'm, I'm delighted to have you all um, with us um, this morning. Um, my first, and as I was saying to Nelly and Alan, my first um, kind of experience of neurodiversity was speaking about it 10 years ago before either of my children were diagnosed. And so it's taken on a real significance for, for me since then. Um, and at the same time, I happened to read a book by Matthew Syed, um, the uh, sports journalist um, uh, 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 called Rebel Ideas. And I would really commend it to you if you are interested in diversity generally or neurodiversity um, and it talks about the power of diversity and inclusion and the pitfalls of um, homophily um, and there's a great quote in it um, so it, I, I'm going to speak about um, the legal side of things and I can't promise it will be um, as uh, as well put um, as this but if you can take anything away <laughs> um, I, 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 I wondered whether I could put it like this we have standardised education, standardised working arrangements, standardised policies, standardised medicine, even standardised psychological theories, all in their different ways fail to take into account human diversity. They treat all people as manifestations of a mythical average rather than as individuals. And this flaw can cause us to overlook human diversity and lose its benefits. We are all different from one another, we have different physical dimensions, but also different cognitive traits, strengths, weaknesses, experiences and interests. And indeed, this is one of the most wonderful things about our um, species. So against that backdrop, um, the legal framework. So as I'm sure it will be no surprise to you that the key legal protection for those with a neurodivergency um, diagnosed um, formally or not, uh, and which um, employers must be mindful of, are the provisions of the Equality Act in relation to disability discrimination. Many people with a neurodivergent condition may not consider that they are disabled. Um, and as neurodivergence exists on a spectrum, it will be just as important as it is with any other physical or mental um, impairment or condition to consider the effect on an individual employee on a case by case basis. Nonetheless, it is important for you as employers to understand that the definition of um, disability in the Equality Act, and which may be relevant to those with a neurodivergent condition, will encompass many of those. And this may have the effect of legally requiring you as employers to put appropriate adjustments in place. But what I would say to you is this, is that whether or not um, the definition of disability is, um, is met, um, and you're therefore bound by particular legal requirements. If you want to support neurodivergent employees at work and help them to thrive, then as a matter of best practice, I would suggest that you would always want to look at what adjustments you could put in place um, to help them and in any event. So I'm sure none of you need a refresher on this, but just so it's front and center, the test for a disability is that there is a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial adverse impact on the ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities and which is long-term. And by long-term, we mean has lasted for 12 months or more or is likely to do so. And it is really important to remember that although each individual is different and each medical condition is different, that test for an employment tribunal remains the same. And it is a case of different facts being put through that same filter. And sometimes that can mean different results being reached for different individuals who um, have uh, the same uh, condition. So you as employers are not expected yourselves to be experts on how different um, neurodivergencies might manifest themselves at work and what adjustments might help counter any challenges your neurodivergent employees uh, face. But you will be expected um, where you're not equipped with that information to obtain appropriate occupational health or other medical input. And the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission Code on Disability goes so far as to say that employers must do all that can be reasonably expected to find out if an employee has a disability. Um, so in the case of Hewitt, um, Mr Hewitt suffered from Asperger's um, syndrome and maintained that his condition affected his ability to concentrate, 
learn or understand. And the governing legislation at the time was the Disability Discrimination Act 1995, and the Equality Act has now replaced that. At first instance, the tribunal concluded that although Mr Hewitt's condition was genuine and had an adverse effect on his ability to participate in human interaction, social relationships and communication, these were not matters um, that uh, he, it, it, he didn't meet um, the, the test for disability under the Act. Now, on appeal, the decision was overturned and it was held that Mr Hewitt's condition could actually fall within the definition of a disability. In the case against um, Gordonston Schools in 2016, um, the need to consider neurodiversity on a case-by-case -case basis was underlined again, and that was a court of de uh, session uh, decision there. And there, the court of session upheld the tribunal's decision that a boarding school pupil at Gordonston's with ADHD was not disabled for the purposes of the um, Act. The court found that the pupil went about her day-to-day -day activities in an entirely normal fashion, as evidenced by the fact that she was able to live in a boarding school and go out on cinema outings without any special consideration. And while her ADHD did impact upon her social skills, the effect was not considered substantial. I do wonder whether the decision would be the same uh, today in 2024, I'm not so sure. And as a mother of a child with uh, neurodiversities, I'm, I'm in no doubt that ADHD has the potential to meet the test of uh, a disability under the Equality Act. In the case of Sherborne against Enpower, the employee there was required to work in an open plan setting with a busy walkway behind him, caused him to feel overwhelmed and distracted. He later became distressed with changes in his working environment and had a breakdown at work, took sick leave, went to his GP who diagnosed him with an anxiety disorder. He then underwent counselling and was referred to a, uh, to a specialist to have an assessment for autism. And the employment tribunal there found that there had been a continuous management failure to understand what the employee's disability was and a failure to make um, reasonable adjustments, including those recommended by the employer's own occupational health team. There, the employee's line manager was found to have made little effort to understand what autism um, might entail and the suggested adjustments weren't put in place. And Mr. Condition, uh, Mr. Sherborne's condition, it was held to fall within the definition of a disability. So I think what the cases kind of demonstrate is that there's no one set in stone definition to determine um, which neurodivergencies will satisfy the definition of a disability in a particular case. It is very uh, case dependent, um, but always proceed um, with caution and act appropriately if you think that there is a chance that an employee may fall within the legal definition. You are under, um, as employers, no duty to make reasonable adjustments unless you know or ought reasonably to have known that an employee in question is disabled and that the employee is likely to be put at a substantial disadvantage because of that disability. And it's estimated that almost three quarters of neurodivergent employees don't disclose their condition because of fear of discrimination and that half of those do later regret doing so. So even if an employee hasn't disclosed their condition um, or indeed had a formal diagnosis, that does not absolve you as employers of your legal duty if you ought reasonably to have known from what they were saying to you. Um, so you have to take reasonable steps and have systems in place to find out um, relevant information. By way of example, in a case against Newport City Council by Mr Gallup, he told Newport that he was suffering from stress with symptoms including lack of sleep, appetite, headaches, nausea. Um, the council referred him to be assessed by its external occupational health advisors and in various reports, um, the occupational health advised that Mr Gallup was suffering from stress which manifested itself in those ways, um, but that he was not disabled for the purposes of the Equality Act. And the Employment Appeal Tribunal held there that the employer didn't have imputed knowledge of the employee's disability. The knowledge imputed to the employer was that the employee wasn't disabled, not that he was, but that was overturned by the Court of Appeal and the court held the task for the Employment Tribunal had been to decide whether the employer had actual or constructive knowledge of the facts concerning the employee's disability. Um, and the, the court felt that the tribunal hadn't engaged with that question. The employer was wrong to have unthinkingly followed an occupational health advisor's, advisor's opinion that an employee wasn't disabled. Um, so while 
occupational health assessments or other medical advice may be helpful, the court made clear that a responsible employer must apply its own mind to the test for deciding whether an employee falls within is potentially disabled or not. Um, that contrasts um, um, a bit with the decision uh, against TC Group, where the Employment Appeal Tribunal held that employers can't be expected to make detailed investigations into the effects there of a rare type of disability without some help from the individual. In that case, um, the employee had photosensitive epilepsy, which was treated with medication. Her interview, however, took place in a room without windows and harsh, uh, with harshly lit um, fluorescent lighting. The tribunal found there that TC hadn't failed to make a uh, 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 an inquiry and that she hadn't been substantially disadvantaged by the conditions at interview. The tribunal felt that if she had provided more information before her interview, then the employer might have been expected to have done more to facilitate her. And the appeal was dismissed on the basis that no reasonable employer would have been expected to know there without further information from her that lighting and arrangements in particular were, were disadvantaging for her. So I think all of that goes really to demonstrate again that decisions are very much made on a case by case basis. But uh, the Gallup case is very strong authority for the proposition that for you as employers, you will be expected to apply your own mind to the information that is available to you. And in cases which might be considered borderline, it would always be prudent to take a cautious approach. So where someone does uh, fall or potentially fall within the definition of a disability under the Equality Act, I'm sure you'll be familiar with the different types of discrimination that the Equality Act prohibits. It prohibits um, direct discrimination, um, that is where an individual is less favourably treated because of a protected characteristic such as a disability. It prohibits indirect discrimination, so that is where a provision criterion or practice um, is apl um, applied by an employer which puts people with a disability at a particular disadvantage and it cannot be shown to be a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So that is the employer can't it doesn't have a justifiable reason for it. Um, and the case against um, of Brooke against the government legal service is a, a classic example of indirect discrimination. Um, Ms. Brooks um, had Asperger's and applied to be a trainee solicitor. Um, recruitment to the government legal service involves undertaking a multiple choice situational judgment test and then further tests and interviews. Um, Ms. Brooks informed the recruitment team at the GLS that um, she had Asperger's syndrome, as she put it, requesting that reasonable adjustments be made for her disability. She was told that an alternative test format to that of multiple choice was not available, um, but other adjustments would be made, such as giving her just a bit more time. And her claims for indirect discrimination and a failure to make reasonable adjustments were successful. Insisting on an unmodified multiple choice test um, was not a proportionate means of achieve, achieving a legitimate aim. Um, so the third type of prohibited discrimination is discrimination arising um, from a disability, and that is where there is unfavourable treatment because of something arising in consequence of a disability, where again, it cannot be demonstrated that the treatment was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And in the case of McQueen against General Optical Council, Mr McQueen was employed as a registration officer. He had dyslexia. Um, some symptoms of Asperger's syndrome and left-sided hearing loss, which caused him difficulties um, with his interactions in the workplace. And there were reports of various instances in the workplace of um, uh, unacceptable behaviour and performance concerns. And the tribunal considered all the evidence there and found that Mr McQueen's insistence on standing up arose out of habit and not as a consequence of his disabilities. And as for um, uh, incidents in which he was disagreeing um, with management instructions and which led to conflict, the tribunal found that those didn't arise from his dyslexia or Asperger's syndrome because he had a short temper and resented being told what to do. And his appeal um, was dismissed and the Employment Appeal Tribunal considered whether the tribunal had been correct to determine that an employee's aggressive conduct and short temper was not something arising in consequence of his disabilities. Um, and the case really demonstrates that, that there has to be a connection between the something leading to the unfavourable treatment and the disability. Um, and it, I think it shows that the existence of that connection will be often, very often highly fact specific and reliant on medical evidence as to the nature of the um, particular neurodivergency and the impact that that might have. Um, 
So, uh, and lastly, harassment on the grounds of a protected characteristic or disability is prohibited. Um, and many employees, um, uh, as I say, who have neurodivergencies say that after disclosure to their employer, um, they are harassed or unfavorably treated in some way. How often still, for example, have you heard people being referred, um, referring to others as being on the spectrum? Um, uh, and uh, there is a possibility for claims of harassment in relation to comments like that. And that's where fostering an inclusive culture and providing educational opportunities for colleagues is so important. And Nelly will touch on that um, in, uh, in a moment. So the final potential legal requirement is the duty to make um, reasonable uh, adjustments. I'm sure you'll be familiar with that, um, but that is where there is a provision criterion or practice applied by an employer which puts a disabled person at a substantial disadvantage in comparison with those who are not disabled. Then the onus is on the employer to take such reasonable steps um, uh, to avoid that disadvantage. Um, and there's a few points worth making in relation to that. Again, an employer will not um, avoid uh, being under the duty unless it could not be reasonably expected to know that an applicant or an employee is uh, disabled or that there is a substantial disadvantage. The legal duty applies where there is a substantial disadvantage, but that might suggest um, that it's a fairly high test, but that is not the case. Um, substantial is defined within the Equality Act as meaning more than minor or trivial. So the threshold is uh, relatively low. Um, the key point is being able to identify the precise disadvantage and without that you won't be able to properly determine what adjustment um, might be appropriate and that is really where um, medical input um, from specialists will be really important in understanding what the effects um, are and how those can be ameliorated. Um, and the final point is that an employer won't breach the duty to make adjustments unless you fail to make an adjustment, which is this word that all lawyers love, reasonable. Um, and the test of reasonableness is an objective one, depending again on the particular facts of the case in question to be determined ultimately by the Employment Tribunal. Um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission code lists a number of factors which um, might be taken into account when deciding whether a proposed adjustment is reasonable. So, for example, um, the extent to which the adjustment would actually help reduce the disadvantage, the financial and other resources available to the employer, the nature of the employer's activities, the size of its um, undertaking or business, etc. Um, and while cost is a relevant factor, don't conclude from that that an adjustment is to be cost effective, to be reasonable. So, for example, for a large and say, for example, public sector employer, um, the, the onus is likely to be higher. Um, um, that they're more likely that given the resources, increased resources, be expected to make adjustments that are not strictly cost effective. That said, very often in the context of neurodiversity, um, appropriate adjustments will entail limited uh, costs. And I read recently one survey of employers that found that as many as 59% of common adjustment types cost nothing for employers. Um, so there's just a couple of cases to kind of bring to life the duty to make um, reasonable adjustments. One was last year against ACOM concerning a Mr. Malin who had uh, dyspraxia and wished to apply for a role in their um, research and development team. He asked to be permitted to make an oral application because of his disability. He was a former employee who had completed the online form, which was required in these, uh, for this role. Um, he'd completed it in the past for them. Um, the HR manager repeated to him that he had to complete the online form, but that he should let them know if he was struggling with any aspect of it. Mr. Mallon didn't answer that question and he didn't explain that he couldn't create a username and password to access the form. He continued to say that I'm happy to do it, the form to, to complete it over the phone um, and that he'd prefer to make an oral application. He didn't phone ACOM because of the fear of being laughed at um, given his ex previ uh, previous experience with another employer. And the HR manager who accepted before the tribunal that it would have been a sensible step to pick up the phone to him didn't call him because she wasn't directly involved in the recruitment process um, and is a, was aware of his previous unsuccessful employment. 
Um, so unable to make his application, he brought a disability discrimination claim, arguing that ACOM had failed to make reasonable adjustments. And his claim was upheld. Um, the tribunal acknowledged that his employer did not have actual knowledge of the particular substantial disadvantage um, because he hadn't given specific reasons as to why he couldn't complete a, the, the online form. But the tribunal decided that his employer had constructive knowledge of the disadvantage to which he was subject. And it found that ACAM ought to have known about his difficulties with accessing the online form. There was no good reason why someone couldn't have spoken to him to discover his particular disability, uh, difficulty um, that for whatever reason he'd been reluctant or unable to explain in an email. And I think the case really illustrates the importance of employers having robust internal processes for dealing with issues that might arise and being alive to those um, during recruitment exercises. Picking up the phone to understand um, a disabled job applicant's needs might seem obvious, but in that case it was overlooked. Um, and I, I talked about the case against NPower um, in the context of satisfying the definition of disability, but it's also a useful case in demonstrating, again, what amounts to make a, uh, a failure to make reasonable adjustments. So despite being informed about a, a likely autism diagnosis, the tribunal found that the employer had not made efforts to understand what autism made uh, uh, or um, meant for this individual. They suggested adjustments weren't put in place um, when that input was sought. And the company had begun a process to assess the individual's capability and performance um, to undertake the role before having sought any input um, from a medical perspective. The employee was offered a lower grade job, which was subsequently withdrawn and his employment terminated without addressing the adjustments um, or completing uh, a more supportive capability process. Um, so the employment tribunal there found that NPower had failed in its duty to make reasonable adjustments. So I wanted just to say a few final words before passing back to Nelly on creating a neuro-inclusive workplace more broadly um, and to signpost in the direction of um, the CIPD guidance on neuro-inclusion at work. Um, and Nelly will talk about this in a bit more detail, um, but earlier this year, the CIPD published guidance and I would commend it to you as a framework for good practice. I know that for those of you um, tasked with um, um, building and maintaining a diverse and inclusive practice, um, uh, that can seem quite a daunting task, I think. You think, gosh, I kind of know where we want to get to, but you know, where do you even begin? There's so much um, uh, uh, to do, um, but there's lots of good practice out there. And I would commend the guide um, it recommend, uh, in relation to neuro inclusion specifically. Um, the guide recommends things like considering office design, flexibility in how, when and where work gets done, proactively catering for different preferences and in communication, instructions and meetings, creating a culture of psychological safety where people feel able to support, recognising that needs are different, even among people sharing um, perhaps the same neurodivergent identity and ensuring that managers feel equipped to have conversations around that, um, to have open conversation, um, and uh, staff feel confident to invite requests or ask for adjustments. Um, and de developing a broad, more broad neuro-inclusive culture by raising awareness of neurodiversity through training, respect of difference, establishing a basic etiquette and emphasizing always the value of diversity so, for example, our firm are on Thursday, um, which I'm chairing, re, uh, leading a neurodiversity um, awareness session internally. And we have three um, members of our staff speaking about their own neurodivergencies. And we very commonly come together as part of the Be Valued network um, that I lead um, uh, to um, bring together staff who talk about their experiences inside and outside of work. And we have found um, within the firm that it is a really power, hearing people's true stories is a really powerful way of raising awareness and uh, really improving um, uh, uh, culture and, and also helping facilitate connections across offices um, uh, with people who have things in common that they perhaps didn't otherwise realize. Um, the CIPD guide also recommends consideration, as I mentioned, of neurodiversity and recruitment and promotion processes, neuroinclusive interview training and alternative assessment me methods. It emphasises the role of HR and DNI specialists, senior leaders and managers 
to really drive forward action on neuro inclusion and to champion um, neurodiversity. Um, and it highlights very much the need for training also of those leading um, diversity inclusion initiatives, neurodiversity um, awareness raising um, on what their roles can be and the impact it can um, make. Um, so that's all for me uh, just now, and I'll hand back over to Nelly. Thank you very much, Morag. Really helpful um, to kind of have those real kind of case examples. And for anybody who have got any questions for Morag or us more widely, please continue to add them in the chat and we will um, get back to those questions as well. Um, so just moving on um, from Morag, now that we've kind of discussed neurodiversity as an umbrella term, why it matters to be neuroinclusive. We've had a little bit around the legal perspective from Morag there, which was really helpful. Um, I wanted us to shift our focus a little bit to explore the strengths neurodivergent individuals bring and the benefits of inclusive practice. Um, because when I'm supporting um, employers and employees, um, sometimes the, the first conversation is happening when things maybe are not going well and actually can we start some of the conversations with what's going well what is somebody good at so I just want to highlight um, a few examples um, of what neurodivergent um, strengths are so you'll see on the slide here these are some strengths which have been taken from the Burback report and we will um, give you um, the link to this following today's session as well now I won't go through each one of these but I'll just offer some examples for the first few so you can see the first one in blue, um, hyperfocus. Now, this is quite a common strength. Many neurodivergent individuals can exhibit intense concentration on specific tasks, and this can lead to quite high productivity and exceptional outcomes, particularly in tasks that require deep concentration. Um, now on the purple, creativity. So neurodivergent employees often think outside the box and generate innovative ideas, which can contribute to creative problem solving and fresh perspectives in projects and initiatives. Neurodivergent individuals can approach challenges from unique angles. So it really leads to effective solutions that might not occur to all employees. So again, it's having this um, neurodiverse group as part of your um, employee makeup because they're gonna be, be able to offer some unique um, perspectives. Detail processing is another area where neurodivergent employees um, often excel at. So that's ability to focus on quite minute details, ensuring accuracy and thoroughness, which of course is an invaluable um, in certain roles which require precision. Um, authenticity, this is another key strength as well. So neurodivergent individuals often bring a level of honesty and straightforwardness to their work. Um, so this fosters a transparent and genuine workplace culture. Um, and of course, there are many more strengths. You can see them on the screen there as well. But to summarize, I just wanted to highlight that if you have inclusive practices that leverage these strengths and many more strengths as well it's not only going to benefit the individual but it's going to benefit the entire organization so i'm going to pass over to alan who will offer a bit more insight on this thanks nelly so um just having a look at the next slide please enya um so benefits and inclusive practice i think nelly's talked about some of that so accessing untapped talent, um, one of the things that I think is worth while reflecting on is if 15 to 20% of the global population are neurodivergent and disclosure of neurodiversity in the workplace is very low, in many cases under 5%, we have to ask ourselves the question, who's in the room and what skills and talents are we not seeing? Again, being strengths focused and leading with what people are good at and not necessarily leading with what's difficult or challenging, it might well uncover a lot of the skills that Nelly's just talked about here. And we've seen plenty examples of people who having the benefit of effective discussions, 
um, have been able to lean into the skills that um, perhaps were latent, actually, from a workplace point of view. So not only are we talking about recruitment and attraction of talent here, but the wealth of expertise that's already in your workforce, and it will be there. So that, I think, is a, a key first point. Um, now, this leads me to the next point around staff engagement. So how do you know um, what you don't know? And I, I think one of the topics that has been mentioned is a culture of psychological safety. Now, you can't just switch that on. You either have it or um, you're on the road to building it. But I think one of the things that we're doing here today is hopefully equipping you with some insights and language that can be useful to go back into your own organizations. And if you haven't done so already, either start or advance the conversations that you're having. One of the big gaps we noticed in the stats up front was the numbers of leaders and managers that had received any form of awareness training. And that's where things can come unstuck. You could have the most effective policies or strategies or employee resource groups, but if it fails at the hurdle of line manager and employee relationships, that's often where we find ourselves in performance-based discussions. And sadly, they are the issues that will come um, to the fore, as Morag talked about, when it gets to perhaps a legal opinion being sought or indeed to a tribunal. So effectively engaging at an individual and, and relational level and getting to know people um, beyond the role and beyond you know, their particular performance is a really key aspect here. And that is a human to human, person centered discussion. Productivity and performance has probably been referenced a little bit here. So assuming you know more about the skills and capabilities of um, individuals that you perhaps weren't seeing before, this is the chance to be able to lean into that. And it's about talent to task, really, isn't it? And it's also about understanding where one person can complement another. And Nelly and I often joke about this. I should not be put in charge of project management and timetables, but I do find that I'm quite creative and quite strategic and I can be quite innovative. But that has to be complemented by detail orientation and seeing the things that I don't see. And that's common of all effective teams. In terms of industrial relations and legal compliance, I think Morag has done a terrific job of setting out when that does fall down and what you can do to come further back upstream and prevent that from happening. And then innovation, which organizations don't have to innovate, particularly in this climate. So recognizing again that within neurodivergent thinking, and that will vary from both neurotype to neurotype, but from individual to individual, um, you will see what perhaps is not seen. And you will find in some cases in discussions um, very different perspectives, sometimes a very directness. Um, and that isn't always comfortable. So once again, going back to being um, more conversant in this topic, becoming more comfortable with different neurotypes and patterns of thinking and behavior, um, we can almost sort of de-risk these conversations and have um, better and more productive relationships. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Nelly, but I'm really pleased to see there's lots of great questions in the chat. So we do want to make time for that. Um, it's 10.43. We said we'd allow about 15 minutes. So, um, Nelly, back to you. And then let's open up and come into some of those questions, please. Yeah, thank you, Alan. So I'll just briefly um, give you a few practical examples in terms of how to approach um, neuroinclusion and a few supports. So I've kind of separated this. Again, I could probably talk about this for hours and this is only going to be a minute or two. Um, so even just having a snapshot, I hope is helpful. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we can better support neurodivergent clients. So this is around strategies which are supporting um, kind of that one-to-one -one client um, facing roles which some of you may be in or some of you might be supporting um, individuals who are in those roles. So these can also be applicable um, to everybody of course um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of these. So um, firstly, so building strong relationships is crucial. As Alan has said, it's that human approach. 
it's establishing trust and open communication that can make a significant difference in understanding and supporting your client or your colleague. Now, what can be really helpful is breaking information down. So think about um, manageable chunks is really effective strategy. So this can make it easier for neurodivergent individuals to process and understand what is being asked of them. Um, now, helping prioritize tasks is often really helpful and quite important. So really clearly identifying what needs to be done first can re reduce somebody's feelings of overwhelming and maybe feeling of um, anxious or just not knowing where to start first. Active listening is also really key. Um, so you might be um, supporting a client or a, a colleague and actually just making affirming noises as well um, and reflecting back what you've heard to show that you value their input and you understand their concerns can be really, really helpful. Um, don't be afraid to kind of reframe and repeat. So that kind of cross checking information. Um, so everybody is on the same page and that instructions are clear. Give time to process information um, so that neurodivergent individual can fully understand and then they can actually respond to tasks and questions. Um, but both Morag and Alan has mentioned psychology safety today, and that is really essential. So it's creating a safe space where individuals can feel comfortable to share their thoughts and their challenges and this can significantly improve their well-being and improve your relationship as well one thing which is often um been um, one of the more, most sought after things is just having information in advance so this can be from anything you actually supporting a client but actually it could be right at the beginning of somebody um, joining your organization so having interview questions in advance for examples so that just kind of helps support um, unexpected changes it helps just reduce anxiety and it just helps somebody to be able to prepare and adapt effectively as well so yeah, hopefully that's helpful. And just a couple of last ones. So just being aware of yourself as well, being aware of your interpretation. Um, it might be of um, your client's tone or their presentation, and it might prevent or cause some misunderstanding or foster um, a better a communication as well. And managing boundaries can be super helpful because that just helps have something structured and predictable as well. So hopefully by incorporating some of these um, kind of practices in your daily interactions can make a significant difference. Um, so I'll just end um, my overview with the next slide. So this is just highlighting a little bit more holistic neurodiversity affirming practices. Um, we've mentioned quite a lot of these already today. Um, but just to highlight maybe some of them, which we've not mentioned, the first one being um, offered, kind of offering tailored individual support. Um, Morag had kind of mentioned some real kind of case examples today. Um, and it's really highlighting that everybody has a unique profile. Each person's needs are going to be unique. Um, so you're going to have to adapt your approach accordingly. So get to know that individual um, is going to be um, the best advice really um to, we've talked about strengths today so really important um to to do that so that is ensuring that um conversations start from there so somebody can thrive in the organization they can progress in roles as well um morag also mentioned validating and accepting lived experiences so i think if you have a voice that's can um allow people to have that platform as well so I'm not going to go into too much, much more detail just in terms of time wise, um, but I do want to highlight the one here with the little um, hat here. So just remember, you don't need to have all the answers. It is OK to seek guidance and learn along the way. Um, and just remember, take that human approach as well. So I really hope that just having a few practical examples um, will be helpful for um, everybody in the room today. Um, but what we'll do, we are going to take some questions um, and I can see some in the chat. So we might not get through all of these today, um, but if we can, we will um, pop a little Q&A fact sheet um, together. So I'll just start by and I'm going to just invite either Morag or Alan or if I'm happy or if I can answer, I'm happy to do that as well. So just going to go to the uh, up to the beginning. Um, so one of the first questions we had is around 
um, does alcohol or drug addi addiction come under neurodiversity? Um, and I, as I'm here speaking, I'll just take this one. Um, just to, um, I suppose, explain a little bit that most um, neurodivergent conditions and neurotypes are um, lifelong and they are from birth. So as we know with alcohol and drug addiction, these are things which can be caused by a kind of environmental factors, absolutely mental health as well. And it can be a co-occurring condition to somebody who may be neurodivergent. It might also be somebody who might be using drugs and alcohol um, in terms of coping mechanisms or, you know, just being able to, um, you know, support them if they are maybe not getting um, support outside of that. So hopefully that's helpful for that question. Um, on um, that, I would just add quickly, Nelly, to mm -hmm. say that alcohol or drug addiction are excluded as being disabilities um, from yeah. the Equality Act. So of themselves, they are not disabilities, mm -hmm. but it's always important to look at, is there something behind that that could amount to, for example, a neurodivergency? Yeah, no, thank you, Morag. Um, Next question, I might come to you more right, whilst you're on the screen. Um, it's somebody who is wanting to maybe support somebody for an occupational um, therapy referral and just asking about how much detail should the employer um, provide on specific kind of tasks or duties of the job to ensure that an employee um, kind of understands what additional reasonable adjustments would help them, um, would help that neurodivergent employee. So I don't know if you have Thanks, any advice Nelly. there. Yep, absolutely. And I think um, it goes to the point that, you know, you're not, you know, I love that. I love that. The, wizard, the kind of wizard hat. And we see this for clients, you're not expected to, you know, have, have all the answers, seek help and support to, you know, improve your understanding. Um, but if you're going to do that, make sure you're, you're informing um, uh, the occupational health or other medical advisor as to they have to have the best understanding of the employee's role, what this entails, so that they're in the best position to guide you on what's most likely to help ameliorate any disadvantage. So it's so important if you go to the step of seeking external input to help you, that you make sure that they are properly briefed in terms of what the role is what it entails and I think in particularly also perhaps for example what the office environment in which um, uh, the role is carried out um, is like. Mm -hmm. Thank you Morag. Um, next question Alan I might bring you in on this one. Um, so the question is to what extent during performance management if nothing is disclosed would an employer have a responsibility to explore possible neurodivergence? So is there an obligation to ask the question or to explore somebody's neurotype? Thanks, Nelly. Um, I'd probably need to defer to Morag on <laughs> obligation, but I think yeah. at an individual level, um, it is sort of morally incumbent on us to try to find out what's going on, what's behind an incidence of uh, underperformance, for example. And we've probably all been in that situation where um, it could be a number of different things. It may be there's been a perfectly good relationship and high performance, and then something has become unstuck. Um, I mean, very often that is going to be because of something, and it might be neurodivergence that is underneath that, or it might be a life event or a combination of the two. So um, I'm not sure from a legal point of view, but certainly at any point, even when things have become quite difficult, um, it is worth bearing in mind, getting underneath the skin of that. And what is it that might be the driving force here? Just as you talked, Nelly, about um, addiction, um, and it's not to say that happens in isolation, but are there underlying factors? And if so, once again, is there a safe space to be able to talk about that? in a non-judgmental way and get to what may be actually causing um, the underperformance. Um, and staying with the topic, Nelly, I'm going to turn the mic yeah. on you. Mm -hmm. So speaking about um, grievances, um, and the question here is, we'd love to cover performance feedback and grievances. We spoke a lot about onboarding, but in um, the experience of work in the performance system itself, um, that can disable people further and it can exacerbate, I suppose, to extend that question, um, the patterns that you're seeing. What's your opinion on that? Okay, so it's about, um, just to make sure I've got the question right, Alan, it's um, around 
performance feedback and grievances and you know supporting the employee or having conversations around that during onboarding is that right well I, I think what the question is driving at here and Don if you want to come in you're very welcome is often that system and that um, dynamic can exacerbate the situation mm -hmm. yeah so I think it's not being too heavy to always follow the particular format of things. I think sometimes it can come become quite mechanical um, when you're having conversations. And I think it's important to, um, as Alan said, have that kind of human approach. And if an experience um, is causing somebody quite discomfort and you're having to talk about somebody's performance review again, it's thinking about can you include the strengths and what somebody is doing well and support them and break it down maybe what they need to do to to kind of reach a, um, a particular performance bit if they know what they need to do to achieve it that's probably going to be better than kind of dismissing it so I think um just to kind of um answer that in a bit of a summary it's just have that conversation with that person if you need to incorporate kind of performance review do that but kind of be mindful of actually can you prov provide the strengths and can you provide um, steps for that individual to be supported to kind of get to where they they need to be achieved so hopefully that's helpful I'm not sure if I've answered that um, in the exact way but again hopefully um, that supports that question. I was going to add in very quickly Alan if that was mm -hmm. okay that something that we're looking at as a firm is having almost like a passport to fly so once someone we've taken someone on you know speaking with them about you know is there anything that we we, we should know that about how you like to work um you know anything you'd like and, and to be quite open actually and kind of proactive about that mm -hmm. um um i know glasgow, glasgow city council you know other um employers do something similar to actually drive the conversation to say you know come to come tell us and um, you know, and to create a, a culture where you kind of normalize that mm -hmm. and, and, and make it easier to have it for someone to say, well, actually, I, I, and you're, you're kind of, and it's kind of almost kind of meeting it head on, like proactively rather than being reactive when maybe things have gone a wee bit awry or askew yeah, sure. and you're having to kind of, uh, you know, kind of backtrack a bit. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Morag. All right, I'm mindful of time. There's two questions we didn't get to. As Nelly said, we'll put a QA and a together and distribute post-event. Um, with the slides we used as well. Um, as we said, the event has been recorded. That will be available on the slides and there's a QR code to access that um, after this meeting as well. You can see it on screen here. If you're quick, you can get um, uh, a link to that just now, but if not, you'll get it afterwards. So listen, a big thank you to you for taking the time this morning. I was keen that we kept our end of the bargain and let you get away on time. Um, thank you, Nelly and Morag, for your contributions and insights. And a big thank you behind the scenes to Enya and the whole team at Burness Paul. We're really grateful for your support. There are deep dive sessions coming up after summer, so there'll be some dates for your diary there. And without further ado, we will let you get on at bang on 11 and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody, once again. Really appreciate it. Thank you.